Vice President. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank the uh, Scientific Committee for uh, selecting my talk. Today I'm uh, talking about an aspect of observing the Anthropocene. Obviously this is a very big challenge. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I'm going to give a little bit of history and some more recent results uh, about what we're doing at the University of Bremen and with our collaborators. Okay, so just to remind you, I told you on Monday, on yeah, Monday afternoon, that uh, you know, the, or reminded you that the population has grown dramatically since the Neolithic Revolution. First of all, on a fuel of mainly biofuel with uh, a bit of coal, and then after the Industrial Revolution, we've gone from one billion, so a few million, to one billion, and then in the last 200 years, uh, we've gone to over seven billion. Now 50% of the population is um, in urbanized living situations and we have entered this new phase called um, a, new, a new epoch uh, called the Anthropocene. And in this we're seeing dramatic changes and mankind, instead of being a kind of stowaway passenger on board spaceship Earth, it's become a dominant player and uh, obviously the impact of what it's doing on human health, we've heard a lot about here, uh, but also the impact on the system as a whole and the future of it. Uh, for example, ozone destruction in the stratosphere, for example, uh, acid rain, for example, um, climate change, all of these things um, were not basically, uh, with the ar arguably climate change, not basically well um, predicted, but were measured. So we think it's really important to measure and provide the evidence base, and that's what physicists do uh, quite well, and physical chemists do not quite so well, but often pretty well. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. So uh, the focus of our work is um, related to uh, a lot of um, air pollution issues and climate change. We've heard about why these things are important and this is the type of typical picture that you can get off the web to show the importance of these things in particular for health. But what we want to do is look at it and understand it and understand how we're modifying these, this very simple system. As I said, you learn this on your mother's knee nowadays. Uh, all the different interacting nonlinear systems which ultimately lead to the production of ozone and or the production of aerosols. And uh, aerosols then feed back into cloud, as we've heard about invigoration or suppression and the hydrological cycle. So this is just part of the game and is only a schematic. And what will happen as things change? What will happen to the surface emissions, etc.? So these are things we want to look at. And uh, this project started about 30 years ago, almost exactly 30 years ago, in terms of putting uh, passive uh, UV visible uh, near infrared, short infrared sensors onto satellite platforms to measure from space. And at the time, uh, it's difficult to believe now, but uh, Jim will remember this at least, that people said it can't be done, it's not possible, etc., etc. Some people still say that. Um, we heard some of that in the meeting. <laughs> um, but the fact is that uh, you can do a lot. It's not perfect like any measurement system. But what you want to do is have a system which comprises low Earth orbit and geostationary uh, in order to get the full spread of measurements uh, around the globe. And you'd like to have this at something like one kilometer resolution. At the moment, what we've done is made quite good strides in nadir sounding from uh, low Earth orbit with sun synchronous orbits. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, the, my own participation in this game, it just shows to the younger people that you have to be persistent. It doesn't help to uh, give up. Mostly, you get told it's uh, useless. Uh, this is the Drummond law of uh, uh, getting um, measurements uh, supported, or, which is, first of all, they tell you it's useless. Then there's a sort of acquiescence phase where people say, well, we've got a bit of money over. You can give it a go. Uh, but we still don't think it works very well or anything like that. And when it's up there and it starts to work and you're delighted by the results, then everybody says, why didn't you do it better? <laughs> why is the resolution so poor? Why don't we get measurements that we really need? So uh, this is an ongoing challenge for us all to try and meet these uh, 
uh, made. But anyway, this was the history of it, and it's been ups and downs and losses of instrument. It's a dangerous game with rocketry. It's always amazing that anything gets up there and works. But what the Saimaki project focused on was measuring in the short, well, in the solar spectral region to enable us to measure these sorts of species and a few extra, and using absorption spectroscopy, which is very simple. Uh, and using scattering theory to understand particles and surface parameters, also absorption at the surface. And this has uh, been a very successful program overall. However, we're not moving as far ahead quickly as we should be doing in terms of uh, improving spatial resolution. However, we now have from Europe an early morning platform, a series of platforms which began in 1995, actually, but. Uh, yeah, with the GOM, which was originally called Sky Mini, and is, that was then succeeded by um, Saimaki. Unfortunately, Envisat as a platform failed two years ago. However, we have GOM 2 in a 930 orbit, so we have 1030, 10, and 930 orbits following one another. And uh, in the future, we'll have Sentinel 5, which improves, or Sentinel 5 precursor as well, but they improve the. Uh, spatial resolution to about seven or eight kilometers and we will have a geoskier called sentinel four uh, as of about 2020 so things are improving uh, and now i'm going to move the results so what we can do is look at long time series in fact uh, michael uh, showed slightly earlier on this uh, some results from NO2, which has been a big theme. It's the sort of remote sensors perfect molecule. It's got lots of structure that you can get onto, and it's around in measurable, uh, very readily measurable quantities. So we've seen these sorts of pictures, and uh, 20 years ago now, we were pleased to say that we were seeing pollution and uh, pulling out biomass burning. I think one of the things has dropped there, but uh, uh, also shipping and uh, outflow from continents. And all these things were seen, and we then decided in, with the first eight years or so of the record to see what was going on in selected regions. And the blue region is China, uh, Europe is red, and green is the um, USA, and uh, uh, we have actually two colors for the USA, so blue, green. And we were able then to look at the trends, and uh, uh, very surprisingly at the time, compared with bottom-up inventories, we found that China was increasing dramatically in uh, NOx-related NO2, our surrogate for NOx. Um, and then we brought this up to date a couple of years ago, um, and we've added in India and uh, the Middle East for specific foci. And you can see that uh, we really see quite different things. But even now, when we compare with the um, with the inventories, we're not in anything like perfect agreement. You can see that India is not, or, uh, so certainly, sorry, China is not yet at the top of it. So um, there are severe disagreements in, in, in trends, although Andreas, who prepared this slide, would say that it's rather qualitative good agreement. Uh, however, I think uh, that we've got a bit of work to do on understanding the inventories still, although generally there's a lot better in agreement than there used to be. However, how has it continued in China? Well, we now have the two GOM-2 satellites, and in respect to NO2, we were actually again surprised, uh, or perhaps not so surprised, to see that actually it's topping out. So we're seeing a, a maximum uh, in the last few years, and uh, the question is why. We obviously want to go back and check that it's not just that aerosol is blocking our view or any other thing like that, but uh, we actually think uh, uh, this Chinese uh, gob of uh, NO2 seems to be uh, seems to be getting stabilised. I'll come back to that later on. India is a good test case for us because uh, it's essentially gone from a rural society to an industrialised one or modern industrialised one over the lifetime of satellites. And here you see from the Saimaki period the dramatic. We're getting 10 percent increases in places there. Uh, so this is the trend pattern um, published by Hillbull et al. from us. Uh, and we're able to attribute. So we're seeing a big change in China and possibly a change in its photochemistry. We're certainly seeing uh, not just in the Indo uh, Gangetic Plain, but obviously in large part in the Indo Gangetic Plain, a large number of uh, increases. And regionally, uh, this is uh, obviously a huge impact and it'll be impacting on uh, monsoon and all sorts of things. Okay, so. Um, that's our, our understanding of the recent changes in India, taking two highlights. SO2, 
Well, this is the picture. I don't want to talk about the South, uh, South Atlantic anomaly where things are a bit difficult, but we were surprised originally from GOEM to be able to pick up tropospheric pollution. SO2 is obviously very short-lived. Uh, we're very good at picking up volcanoes. That was already done with TOMS, with uh, Alan Kruger and uh, others, uh, NASA. Uh, so we pick up these things very well, and there's lots of fun you can have with uh, following plumes of volcanoes. But just with respect to China again, what we've seen there is that uh, policy has had an effect, the reduction of uh, uh, SO2 in uh, roughly 2006 policy change has helped. However, um, we think it's sort of going up again. This is probably just uh, a basis of um, uh, the sheer amount of power that's being generated. So there's no way that we think uh, or we would still recommend further and significant uh, desulfuration in order to be able to meet uh, modern uh, aspirations with respect to air quality. Now just switching gear a bit to methane. We've heard a lot about increases of methane and uh, the changing increases which are not known. Now methane is one of these sort of substances between uh, climate uh, research or climate change research and atmospheric chemistry. It's a major source of um, Hox radicals in the globe uh, in remote places. Uh, so it plays a big role in, in our understanding of ozone production and destruction. So it's been studied also for a long time, but these findings on the left-hand side from the ground-based network show that uh, we don't really understand the increases. Now, how does SIMACI do on this? Um, this is our 10-year record. At the bottom is uh, the zonal averages, and we're seeing increases in the Northern Hemisphere and the distributions. You've perhaps all seen the movie from me in the past on these things, so you see the yearly cycle. But specifically, this time, I'm interested in differences, and particularly in the USA, differences before fracking began and afterwards. We just clip the beginning of the fracking timescale with our measurements. And uh, this has been a dramatic change of energy resource. Now I understand the USA is now a net uh, exporter of, uh, of gas as opposed to being an importer. So you see these three well-known uh, places and uh, we've gone in and analyzed them. That is Oliver Schneising, Mikhail Bukvitz. And we see plumes in uh, uh, Bakken and in uh, Eagle Ford and also over Pennsylvania. Um, we've done an analysis, uh, just an analysis, which is where we've looked at the average wind speeds and then we've uh, looked basically upwind and downwind uh, over these periods. And for the Bakken and Eagle Ford, uh, this is the take home message that we get um, on the right hand side. It's perhaps easy to understand in percentage. This is the leakage, our estimate of the leakage rate, and we're getting 10% uh, for both Bakken and Eagle Ford. This is to be compared with the roughly 2 to 3% to which the EPA suggests is break even point with respect to uh, climate change or, car or, or, or being greener. Uh, because uh, methane has a higher global warming potential, um, but produces more energy per CO2 emitted. This is a balance. But this says at the moment, at least, that current practice, this is not perhaps surprising, some of the uh, NOAA measurements uh, and related are shown next to it for in particular in situ measurements. But uh, this is a fantastic result from the point of view of remote sensing that we're seeing something. And we hope we are right. And uh, well, we think we're right. Um, and uh, this will add to uh, our debate about uh, how to use fracking if we are using it well. Uh, now, just nipping over to CO2, finally, what processes regulate CO2? Okay, so the emission is roughly uh, this is increasing but similar and is smooth, but we see large jumps up and down, and so what's regulating these things? Okay, and uh, that's the big question. And the answer is photosynthesis by land plants and ocean uptake. And why does this amount sort of jump around from year to year? Will this behavior change in the future? It's obviously a critical issue. Now, in this respect, first of all, we can see increases uh, over cities, and we compare with uh, emissions, and we get, this is a busy slide, but basically over these source regions where population is high, we're sort of getting reasonable uh, agreement, okay? Um, and so that's the take-home message there that we think we can, by averaging these things uh, over the 
time scale we've got, we can get this out. However, when we look at the yearly cycle, um, uh, and we go in and, and look at, uh, we compare also with Carbon Tracker, what we're able to see is that the amount of um, CO2 uh, per year is related to the, the change in temperature, okay? So uh, what we're seeing is that the stomata on the leaves close when it's hotter and therefore uh, don't take up as much CO2. So this is part of explaining that curve and I think we were able to show it rather nicely with these plots, uh, both using ground-based data from NOAA, or they're using their ground-based data and their results, and our showing it from uh, space. So we think this is quite an important contribution to our understanding of how um, CO2 emissions are being um, taken up at the surface and how we need to, how will this change in the future? That question we haven't answered. Now, just getting back to NO2 and CO2 and uh, looking at the ratio of CO2 to NO2 as observed from space, um, what we're able to do here is pick up these regions again and uh, do an analysis. And we can actually do a daily analysis on both NO2 and CO2. And what Max Reuter and uh, uh, Michael Bukwitz have shown nicely is that um, in CO2, the green line, uh, and uh, NO2, we're seeing over Europe and America, when you take them together, a, a, a weekly cycle, so people uh, don't use as much power when they go to church. But in China, uh, they don't have a weekend. And so you can see the lack of a, a, a cycle here. This is well known in NO2 that we have uh, less emissions on the uh, religious days, whether it's in the Middle East or in the, Europe, or in, uh, but in, in China, uh, emissions continue. So this is uh, it's an interesting thing to have seen. In addition, when looking at that ratio, uh, it shows, looking at the ratio of NO2 to CO2, it says that the, uh, that's F here. And uh, so these are the changes, but the ratio uh, over uh, Europe and North America and East Asia is different. And we, we see that the um, CO2 is essentially continuing to go up, but the NO2 is coming down. That goes back to what I showed, so that's in agreement with what I was showing on the sim simple NO2. Okay, so I think we've had a pioneering age. We need uh, an adequate space segment to observe the Anthropocene. That's the question whether we'll have one. And uh, we do have a Nadia sounding program, but I don't think it's going forward fast enough to achieve the uh, spatial and temporal, sam spatial resolution and temporal sampling that we really need. Um, and uh, this is all uh, uh, a, ca a question of political will. Uh, and uh, these things cost um, a fair amount of money. But for example, um, I did a calculation which said that if you put a cent on a barrel of oil equivalent, uh, explicitly, like in Switzerland, focused towards uh, measurement systems, like you can do in Switzerland, you can do laws like that, raise taxes specifically. We would have so much money uh, to spend on measurement systems, so it's a 10 to the minus 4 tax. You'd never notice it at the petrol pump, um, but uh, in fact, it would give us so much money for measurement systems, we wouldn't know what to do with it. So I think uh, you have to go back to your political leaders and uh, uh, make sure we have a good system. Thank you very much for the future. OK. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, maybe we only have time, have time for maybe one question. Just one, sorry. Go ahead. Hey, John, thank you for uh, the nice uh, presentation. I, I would like to, to ask you what you uh, think uh, uh, about the uh, need for geostationary platforms uh, for, uh, for air quality um, monitoring. If you think that uh, what, what we have now is adequate, uh, what uh, can, can we hope for the future? Well, I, I think Thank you, Sandra, for the question. Uh, but uh, so I don't think the system is anything like adequate. I think we've come through a pioneering age showing discovery and showing what we can do. And I don't think we've got going yet on the proper system. Now, um, the Sentinel-4, formerly GeoSkia, a proposed as GeoSkia, is a very much descoped version of uh, what could be done. 
you know, over Europe. Uh, so we will get this on the media. It is uh, manifested and will fly in 2019, 2020, and will provide uh, diurnal variation. Now, in 2000, we basically proposed this in 1998 to 2005, six period, okay? And this is a descope version of our smallest version, which was called Geo, Geostationary R for regional or something, okay? And that was what was then funded. So the good news is that we've got it. The bad news is that it's about eight kilometer resolution and only over Europe. So we're not doing over Africa. So my take home message is we can do these things uh, we just need a lot more of them. We need some constellations uh, to be able to provide the, the thorough monitoring of the system that we need and to avoid cloud contamination and all those sorts of things. Uh, so thanks for the question. The answer is I'm not happy with what we've got. We need much more and uh, we need to somehow get that to provide the policymakers with the information they need and test our models.